Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have prepared a very interesting uh, episode with Mr. David Pattinson. Um, it's great to have you, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like our videos because we are trying to give you great content. And today we're gonna talk about something very interesting. It's gonna be about Harvey Weinstein and the link to Alison Saunders. Yeah. So how come do you see there is a link between the two of them? Well, let's just clarify. So, I mean, Harvey Weinstein has been accused of, of really a couple of things. One is abuse of power. He sort of lured young, beautiful actresses to his hotel room and, uh, you know, dangled multi-million dollar movie deals in front of them in exchange for sexual relations with with the actresses and also he's accused of actually you know raping the actresses if they didn't agree to his requests and um, this was a big media story that blew up um, kind of October of, of 2017 and um, 70 plus actresses came forward to say they'd been you know bad behavior by Weinstein towards them similar to what I've just described. And um, he was eventually charged uh, about a year later with um, sexual assault against two women, two separate women. I think there's a couple of charges against each woman. He hasn't gone to trial yet in New York, but um, the trial was scheduled for, for this autumn, but it's been postponed to early uh, next year, early 2020. So that's, they're the two kind of charges against Weinstein, abuse of power, and um, actual rape or sexual assault against two women, and uh, and that's that's where that's where it stands right now. Right. So, in regards to Saunders, do you think she also abused uh, the power toward British men? Well, there's no doubt that that she did, in my opinion. I mean, Alison Saunders was abusing her authority as head of Crown Prosecution to prosecute men without evidence there was you know evidence from the accuser but when it turned out that that evidence was false or there was other evidence that contradicted it Alison Saunders would manipulate that evidence to only portray the man in a bad light so you had these trials that weren't fair trials they were unfair trials Alison Saunders used the media to gin up guilt or the presumption of guilt against the man and um, you know men went to jail or men committed suicide um, even though they, they hadn't committed any, any sex crime. And she ginned up a lot of mistrust in the British judicial system. So there's a lot of people that have been um, angry at Weinstein about abuse of power, and we don't want him abusing his power over young, young actresses. Right. But Alison Saunders is, is equally bad, in my view. I mean, I won't say worse, because you know I like to be very politically correct, but as bad. So for all the people that have a strong feeling of hostility towards Weinstein, I want to direct their, that feeling of hostility towards Alison Saunders. Alison Saunders is a British citizen. She's been abusing British people, British men specifically, because she didn't abuse any British women. And, um, you know, American people are worried about Weinstein, but we can actually, you know, put an end to abuse of power in our country by, by prosecuting Alison Saunders. That's what we're doing with the citizens' prosecution. All right. so. Let's draw some common features that you think that both of them have. Well, I think let's just, um, you know, do a bit of a summary of, of Weinstein. I mean, he was a very, very successful Hollywood producer back in the 1990s and early 2000s. And, and he was winning Oscars and all this sort of stuff. Um, he is a very um, unique figure in Hollywood. There's not that many producers dishing out you know, $10 million movie deals to women. But there's a, an abundance of beautiful women in Hollywood that are interested in these roles. So there's this sort of inverse power dynamic, the feminists would say. I mean, one of these accusers said, you know, Harvey Weinstein's power was 10, mine was zero. Um, a lot of people in society look at beautiful women as sort of rare and unique and uh, special people. And if you look at society at large, you know, they are, they're very unique. But if you go to Hollywood, beautiful women are, are everywhere. I mean, there's such a concentration of them. So Harvey Weinstein's able to, to get away with treating beautiful women in a not good way because there's such a demand 
from these women to, to be close to him or get business from him through these movie deals. Um, now, what I think is not mentioned in the, all the press coverage of Weinstein is the women that were proactively trying to meet with him, offering sexual relations with him to get a movie deal. They haven't really been, been talked about. It's always implied that you know women, and this may be true, women that they met with him, they didn't want to have a sexual relationship with him to get the movie deal. Um, but the women that maybe did offer that have not been have not been raised. And I think you need to have, we talk about these false accusations, you and me, we talk about them a lot. And there needs to be context on both sides. I mean, you know me, I'm a big advocate for, for female safety. Um, but I think women, especially in this Weinstein case, the women are, um, you know, in control of their own, the solution to their own problem. If they're not going to the hotel room at 11 p.m., they're not going to get assaulted. If they're going to the meetings with their bodyguard, with their boyfriend, with their husband, with their father, with their agent, with their business manager, they're not going to be getting assaulted. But I believe they're deliberately going there on their own so they can use their sexual power to, you know, convince Weinstein or to entice Weinstein into hiring them for, for the movie, for the $10 million movie deal. And um, So wait a second, who abused of power? Weinstein because he has authority and fame and money and so on, or women who have, as you say, the sexual power? Well, this is the, this is the double standard, Alexandrina, and I'm glad you asked that question because if there's a beautiful woman who's got lots of men interested in her and she withholds sex from them in order to get benefits from them. Maybe they take her on holiday. Maybe they buy her and her friends a round of drinks at the bar. Maybe they, you know, take her on a shopping spree. Maybe they let her move into their house. Women get a lot of benefits from men with the promise of sexuality. Um, whereas when Harvey Weinstein turns the table and say, well, I want sexual benefit up front before I give you a $10 million movie deal, all of a sudden, well, this is like an abuse of power. Um, or this is like outrageous behavior, or this is abuse of women. So when it's women doing this to men, this, there's no problem, it's not an abuse of power. But when it's a man doing this to women, it's an abuse of power. So that's, it's a cultural double standard that has emerged um, over the last 20 years, particularly the last few years, where women's behavior towards men or women abuse of men is, there's no problem, no one worries about that. But men's abuse of women is a very, very serious thing. Now, I want to have good behavior by men to women, but I also want to have good behavior by women to men. That's why I'm going after Alison Saunders so aggressively. I mean, I'm happy to go after Weinstein, say he's a bad guy, say is, I mean, I'm not going to say guilty until proven innocent, but worthy of charge. How about I say that? But then so too is, is Alison Saunders. But a lot of the people that criticize Weinstein they never mention Alison Saunders. So this is um, you know, part of the double standard that exists. And um, you know, I think that's why it makes the Weinstein case an interesting one. I've heard that the name of Weinstein also um, was heard in your, uh, in your trial. Yeah, well, I did mention that to you. And um, this is what, um, something I wanted to talk about because I had my trial, which we've discussed previously. And it was obvious after three days that, you know, everyone was searching high and low for some sort of misdemeanor or, or criminal offense that I might have committed. And it was obvious there was none. So the prosecutor is doing a summary to the jury. It's part of what happens in a trial. Both the prosecutor and the defense do a sort of a closing summary. And the prosecutor's getting up to do his closing summary. And I'm thinking, well, well what sort of the hell is he going to say? He's, I mean, he's, kind of got, he's got nothing to say here. And he gets up and he says, you know, I think we can all agree that, that Mr. Pattinson is no Harvey Weinstein. Um, and, uh, you know, as in like, you know, I'm not the baddest guy going. And, you know, this, I have no criminal record of any kind in my life. Um, so it was, it was trying to sort of underplay the fact that this was a malicious prosecution against me. But of course, Alison Saunders had been fired four days earlier from, from CPS having presided over a mass of malicious prosecutions against British men. So the prosecutor could have said, you know, he, the prosecutor, was no Alison Saunders, as in this case is not a malicious prosecution against David. 
but he didn't say that. They want to conceal the fact that Alison Saunders is an abuser of power, but highlight the fact that Weinstein is even though at that time Weinstein had not been charged with, with any crime. So you have the British Crown Prosecution Service <coughs> excuse me, presuming guilt pre-innocence or pre-trial against a foreign citizen in a British court of law, and the judge didn't say anything, and the jury's sort of looking around like, what the hell is he talking about? And I'm sort of saying, like, I don't know what the hell's going on here. And what I, th I thought about it afterwards, and it was kind of a moment where the Rubicon, we'd kind of crossed the Rubicon from... British law into pop culture, and pop culture takes precedence over, over law, you know? Um, and that's what was interesting, um, you know, about that moment, and I don't think I'll ever forget it uh, for the rest of my life. Hmm. All right, so basically what you're saying is that both of them abuse of power, right? Um, okay, we can say that in the Weinstein case, there was the private sector, whereas with Saunders it's a public sector. Yeah, I mean, private sector, obviously, in, in Hollywood, um, Miramax was a major uh, a movie, movie studio mm. at the time. But, of course, if women didn't like... So I'm always looking at the women and, you know, what other options they have. If they don't like working with Weinstein at Miramax, what's wrong with going to Warner Brothers or Paramount Pictures or Sony or um, Columbia? Or, or any of the others. Uh, they have a choice there. Um, they can act, they don't have to go to Hollywood either. They can act in, in New York or in, in other cities. Um, it's, Hollywood is not a monopoly on, on mo movies. But if you're getting charged by the Crown, Cross Crown Prosecution Service in Great Britain, that's a monopoly. You don't have any escape from that. Mm. Um, you know, if you've got the police knocking on your door saying we're going to prosecute you, you know, what do you do? You, you're going to be prosecuted one way or the other. You don't have any choice. You don't have any choice about it. Right, right. Um, would you say that um, what happened to Weinstein obviously damaged his career? Yeah. But what happened to Saunders? Is this also uh, a damage, a big hole into his career? Well, I think, um, I mean, Weinstein is kind of on the down of his career. I mean, he's a hugely successful man. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, he is um, kind of coming up to his late 60s now. We're almost 70 years old. He's kind of on the downward swing. Um, Alison Saunders obviously was at the height of her career as, as head of CPS, mm -hmm. and she was fired from there, but got the, um, the crony capitalism gig like we talked about. Um, you know, I... I mean, if it wasn't for citizens' prosecution coming along, Alison Saunders would be expecting to earn millions in, in the private sector. Mm -hmm. If she gets um, guilt, is found guilty in the citizens' prosecution and goes to prison, um, you know, maybe she'll be in a similar type of um, prison to, to maybe one Harvey Weinstein ends up in. How do you think the feminists see uh, both of Well, I think characters? we talked about this in the past, and I was thinking about it. Um, you know, what happens is these women, like I said, they want to use their sexual power as part of the negotiation. I mean, Hollywood can pass a law right now to say no meetings with, between actresses and producers unless the actress has a chaperone or personal security with her. But they're not going to do that because feminists want the women to have the flexibility to use their sexual value in the meeting. The women, they say, you know, her body, her choice. Um, you know, if she wants to trade sexual intimacy for the movie deal, she should be free to do that. But no one's saying Weinstein's money, Weinstein's choice. You know, he's not given the same uh, freedom to trade uh, money for sexual intimacy on his part, um, or nor any other men. So that's, that's the double standard. I mean, if women don't want to get assaulted, and I don't want women to get assaulted, they can take the, the proper precautionary steps. Um, but I believe that women are willing to risk assault in exchange for a $10 million movie deal. They don't want to get assaulted, mm -hmm. but they'll take the risk of meeting with the guy, with the producer in the hotel room at 11 o'clock. If they get assaulted, that's bad news, but then that's when they get taxpayers to come in and pick up the tab for prosecution. Now, if you're a taxpayer, you're saying, well, why do I have to pay for prosecution when you, the woman, put yourself at risk. I mean, I was watching a documentary on Weinstein the other night, and there was a girl on there, and she went up to the hotel room, and there was some sort of incident where 
he wanted to give her a, he wanted the girl to give her a massage and she said I don't really do this so I'm leaving and that was kind of that and then you know a year later when Weinstein's in her town she calls up and and she does another second meeting in the hotel room and she's saying like you know I thought I knew I was taking a risk but I just thought I'd do it to um to try and get the movie deal and you just got to think this girl's judgment is shockingly poor she's in her hometown and you're trying to tell me that she couldn't get hold of her father or a boyfriend or a bodyguard or a agent or a lawyer or a brother or a uncle or a chaperone to come to the meeting with her she has to go on her own and then taxpayers have to come in and pick up the tab for prosecution and the woman has put herself in the vulnerable situation now if she gets the movie deal it's great for her right she gets the 10 million bucks but if she doesn't get the movie deal taxpayers now have a bill of their own to pay for her bad judgment so you know this is the thing that's not talked about with Weinstein why are the women not held to a standard of good judgment we want Weinstein to use temperance and restraint uh, with his sexual behavior but women what about why aren't they using temperance and restraint uh, we want to have good judgment from men and we want to have good judgment from women and um, you know that's something that has not been discussed at all I think it will come out in the case um, Weinstein will say you know these women were texting me and emailing me saying look I'm I'm in the lobby can I come up to the hotel room um, and um, you know he's gonna say well I thought they were interested in a sexual relationship with me every time I met this girl she's saying how great a producer I am how much she loves me how much everyone she's met loves me so they're feeding the guy's ego to get the movie deal and he's able to interpret it as they must have been interested in me romantically you know? so in both these cases you find the women guilty actually uh, well I think they're culpable they, they, they women have to be responsible for their own actions in popular culture we say men are responsible for their actions women have no responsibility for their actions unless it's a positive outcome If the women lands a movie deal she's a smart smart woman she's a talented woman if the woman gets assaulted by going to the hotel room on her own at 11 p.m., it must be the guy's fault. You know, it can't possibly be the woman's fault because, you know, she had the bodyguard on speed dial, but, you know, her phone was out of battery or something like that. Um, also, there's, there would have been women in Weinstein's world who um, worked with him for a long time or were in his orbit that, that never got assaulted because they always met with him in a public place or they always met with him with a chaperone mm. or whatever. We don't hold those women up as being heroes. We hold the women up as being heroes that got assaulted. So there's this sort of skewed set of, um, of public um, praise over women that get assaulted. So you, now you see young women saying, well, I, need, I feel like I need to get assaulted in order to get all this attention that all these other women that get assaulted get. Whereas the women that use good judgment, I talked about this with you before, why aren't we praising them, you know? They, they go about their business, they're successful, no one ever assaults them. Um, but it's the women that are using their sexual power to provoke men sexually. They don't necessarily want to have a sexual relationship with Weinstein, but they want him to think that they do. They want Weinstein to think, if I give this girl a, a movie role, maybe she'll reward me with a sexual, um, you know, sexual intimacy you know at some point down the road and i can get to know her better and i can build an intimate relationship with her that's what the women want to do so they provoke sexually they show up in the hotel room mini skirt high heels makeup um on their own telling harvey what a great right. guy he is but there were so many other women who are who were and still are perhaps reluctant to talk about this. In, yeah. because well, they should the talk about it. I mean, let's hear about it. I mean, I want to know all the, the actresses in Hollywood that are getting movie jobs by sleeping with producers. That'd be interesting public information. I want to know the actresses that get jobs on merit and the jobs that get, get jobs on sexual relations with the producer. Right. So there are a good hand of women who want to use uh, Harvey's uh, power and the social status to get attention towards them. Well, but there are also women who are silent. They do not want to talk about this because they are afraid. Just like in Sonda's case, perhaps there are many men who are reluctant to speak about this because they're also afraid. That is true. They're afraid. But I encourage everyone to speak up. You know, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from speaking up. I'm trying to prevent 
this sort of stuff from happening, Alexandrina. I mean, I want the women to not go to the hotel room, and when they meet with anyone in Hollywood, they've got their bodyguard with them. They're not going to get assaulted when that happens, okay? So that's like a good thing. No assault for the woman, no bill for the taxpayer. That's a win-win. Men in Britain, I want them to be given the right to the assumption of innocence who are proven guilty. I want all the evidence about them to be presented in court, not just the cherry-picked stuff. And, um, you know, any prosecutor or any head of CPS that does not allow the assumption of innocence who are proven guilty or who manipulates evidence, I want them to be prosecuted. And let's start with Alison Saunders. Forget about the fact she's a woman. If it was a man prosecuting women maliciously, the guy would go straight to prison, as, as I've said before and as you know full well. So why is it because it's a woman head of Crown Prosecution Service that we give her a million pound payoff and say, you know, have a happy retirement? Um, in case, in the Weinstein case, there was a big media, um, uh, it was a big media coverage, whereas with Saunders, uh, it's not that much. Well, it was big at the time. Um, it was a, a big news story, but it was a sort of a short-lived news story because it goes against the feminist narrative. The feminist narrative is men are bad, women are good. Men abuse their power over women. You know, women are these sort of innocent creatures. I mean, the women I've talked about in these interviews are, you know, your typical young, feminine, fertile, beautiful um, women. That's what, you know, men think of women. Alison Sorn is the total opposite of that. She's older. No one is going to describe her as beautiful. She's almost in the masculine role as head of a big organization. She's in the Harvey Weinstein role. She's... Um, you know, this sort of bullying, tyrannical leader hiring and firing people, creating a climate of fear and breaking the law uh, in the process. So, so you know, would, would when I'm talking about these women actresses, they're sort of, you know, feminine people. Uh, Alison Saunders is a powerful individual when she's the number one person with prosecutorial authority over an entire country. So would you say that Saunders is the Britain's... Harvey Weinstein. Uh, I would definitely say that Alison Saunders is Britain's Harvey Weinstein. I mean, I won't say she's worse because, you know, I don't want to make myself unpopular. But I will say she's at least as bad. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think the citizens' prosecution is, is going to show that. I mean, I'll follow the Weinstein trial. Um, I think what's strange about the Weinstein trial is that 70-plus women came out and said, oh, yeah, I was abused or assaulted by Weinstein but yet he's only been charged of, of assaulting two women. And people say, well, that's two too many. Well, fair enough. But what, where's, where's, what's going on with the other 68? I mean, maybe statute of limitations has run out or maybe there's not enough evidence or, or maybe their stories were, were not credible or whatever it is. Um, but I mean, I've definitely got 70 plus men that can say, yeah, I was maliciously prosecuted by Alison Saunders and, uh, you know, we can get all them to come to court and, and say so. And um, you know, I think it will be um, persuasive to a, a British jury to say, why is this head of British prosecution, crime prosecution, maliciously prosecuting all these, all these British citizens? You know, why can't they be granted a fair trial? The other thing about Saunders, I mean, it'd be bad enough it was, if it was men and women being equally prose maliciously prosecuted, but of course she was only prosecuting men, so we have to add another charge of sexism. Uh, because, as you know, Britain takes sexism very seriously, especially when it's men being sexist towards women. Here's an example of a, Alison Saunders being sexist towards men because only men are being maliciously prosecuted, no women were. You know.